You're listening to TFM. Want to join in the conversation and share your thoughts on this episode? Join the Babel Conference, our listeners' discussion group on Facebook. Just type B-A-B-E-L into the Facebook search field, and we look forward to seeing you there. Well, hello and welcome to TFM's local watering hole. Coming at you from Navarro, and uh, this it, it's not a bar anymore, uh, it's a school, uh, but they're letting us use this for our recording session. Uh, thankfully, Grief Karga has brought the good stuff tonight so that we can discuss Mandalorian Season 3, and I could not be more excited to welcome in the one and only Jedi Master, John Mills. Yeah, glad to be back. Glad to be back. Bar, school, it's all the same thing. I drank in both of them myself, so whatever. <laughs> so you're the one who was spiking the punch at all the dances. Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. It was like an episode of Grease, <laughs> only with blasters and Rodians. Nice. Fantastic. Well, we're excited to talk about this. Uh, of course, remember, you can find us wherever you get your podcasts. And if you're listening to this, just hit the subscribe button and that way you'll get all of the episodes as soon as they become available. You can also follow us over on uh, Twitter and Instagram. On Twitter, we're at the 602 Club. On Instagram, at the 602 Club TFM. We would love it if you would also uh, give us a star rating review over on Apple Podcasts and help other people find the show. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash trek.fm. We've got the entire network, of course, housed at trek.fm, where you can see all of the different shows that we're doing here. We've got a listeners-only discussion group on Facebook called the Babel Conference. You can join and talk to listeners from all over the world. And if you like what we do here on 602 Club as well as TFM, please help us out by going to Patreon at patreon.com slash trek.fm and become part of our team and make sure that all of these shows that we work so hard on can keep coming to you each and every week. So, John, there is, I would say, an important Ronto in the room that we need to discuss, I think, right off the bat all with right. this season. Mm -hmm. And that is the story editing. Yes. Because... I believe it to be the biggest weakness of this season. And first, I wanted to, to tackle it this way. Do you believe that maybe some of this story editing, some of these story editing issues possibly comes from the fact that the Rangers of the New Republic show has not moved forward and therefore some of the plot points that we might have been getting in that show are actually having to be done here in the Mandalorian and therefore because they are building towards something we know um, so do you think that that possibly has an impact on some of the storylines we've seen put into season three of the Mandalorian it's possible I, I have no lens on that I, you know probably the pirate stuff setting up those sorts of things like how the pirates relate to this or that I think that the the I, I do think that the overall way that they brought the points together is the biggest weakness of the season. I think that there are plenty of things that feel like they were transplanted or forced in here. I think that's probably what we're all reacting to is there are things that happened. There's one episode in particular where it feels like it was a different series. Ep it was the episode from another series with the Mandalorian right. bookending it, and it, it it was the, the it was the, the the Doctor's story on Coruscant. Mm -hmm. I was like, "Well, yeah. what am I even watching here?" And it felt to that point like setup that was unnecessary. There, there was a whole lot that wasn't disciplined. Uh, in what they chose to show and what they chose to reference. Honestly, mm -hmm. yeah. 
there are a whole lot of things where I quite like it felt like there was filler of certain types of things to get it to eight episodes. And then there were things up to and including in the finale where I said, well, if they'd given this some time to breathe. Right. And given me a three episode arc for the, the series, the season finale, then that would have felt more organic and more earned. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I you know, I, I struggle to think of a specific point of failure, but the way that the story came together for this season feels like there were a couple of points of failure for it. And part of that is being an overly critical fan. I, I know that there are going to be plenty of people that disagree with me. There are going to be plenty of people that in two years are going to say, well, we were too hard on Mando season three, but in the moment, uh, yeah, the, the way that things were put together, this feels like they had four episodes of Mandalorian, maybe five. And then the rest was just stretching it and putting stuff in that they were being forced to put in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I think, you know, this is this is interesting, too, because this is not just a, a thing that I've heard from, you know, or, or thought myself. Um, this is also something that I've heard from ardent fans who tend to to be more forgiving than either you or I. Mm-hmm. And so this is I mean, and I've also seen this in the trades as well. Um, And so I, I feel like that this season really did struggle in in its storytelling editing which is it's so important when you're doing art series and you know one of the things i think was a real hallmark of the first two seasons was the way in which each episode seemed to be able to stand on its own tell its own adventure but at the same time be advancing an overall narrative arc that was leading us to a completion for that season Mm-hmm. And this season, I think, really struggled in that because we kind of cracked open the Star Wars universe and we're playing in more parts of it. But that's not to say that I don't think that the bones of an actual good season that flowed much better narratively was there. I think it absolutely was. What it needed, I feel like, is for somebody to just sit down and be like, okay, these are all the storylines that we're telling from start to finish here. How do we interweave those storylines better throughout more episodes so that we feel more connected with the storylines that are happening? And they don't necessarily feel so jarring in the sense of the way that, and, you know, maybe people will get frustrated that I bring this up, but the way that Andor was able to weave three or four different really important story thread points and characters were following till they all come together at the very end of the season. And I think that's more of what this season needed in its storytelling editing. I, I know that the, the back and forth, I think that one of the, one of the biggest challenges I have with it is there are plot points that are overindulged for the sake of being showy. Mm-hmm. And they are, unfortunately, what slows down a lot of things. Um, sure. The whole thing with uh, Captain Christmas Tree, whatever his name was. And yeah. Um, yeah. I, I don't remember his name. I, I, I legitimately don't remember his name. I like to think of him as, uh, as, as Captain Easter Egg Basket. All right. Uh, that works for me, too. <laughs> and. and uh, but but it was it was one of those things where where they showed up and I said oh okay well this is going to be something they're going to keep doing okay we're we're back to the, oh and they're oh they're dead now huh okay and it seemed to me that there's more of a threat there's more of a sense of threat or purpose to have them lose more substantially when we first encounter them and then they fade away, they're like seriously damaged. So the threat still exists. And even if you wanted to have it be something tease their return at the end of the season, they're a lingering threat that remains out there sort of thing. Right. Um, And, but, but it is one of those things where in terms of editing all of the arcs together, I, I really, Real like everybody loves to beat up on the Jack Black and Lizzo episode. And mm-hmm. I think there are some things there that could have been done a lot better. Um, 
But the one I go back to, the one that's always going to be the baffler, is the Doctor on Coruscant. I think that is that was the first indication to mm-hmm. me that there was – it was actually the first episode was the first indication to me that there was going to be something amiss with the way that the points were right. edited yeah. together. Yep. Going to Bo-Katan is the opening of your second episode. It's not the end of your first episode because right. it confused yeah. it confused his through line. Exactly. Because he's, yeah. he's looking for IG-11 in an IG-11 part. And then he suddenly goes to Bo Katan and it's like, wait, what? There's what? What? What what's mm-hmm. happening? Whereas you could yep. ameliorate that by having it be the next episode. And then yeah. and then just that that episode with the doctor. I just stick I just stick on it, man. Yeah. It really bothers me. Especially because it could have even just been addressed as dialogue from uh, uh um from Moff Gideon. Well, and, and I know I think you're kind of nailing where the issues really begin. And part of that, I think, is the very first episode. I'm I'm actually very harsh on the first episode. I think it's actually a ridiculous uh, beginning to the season because it really doesn't make a lot of sense because so much of the episode, the way it's told, isn't actually needed. And that whole going back to Navarro part makes no sense uh, because the way that the storyline is edited, like you said... Okay, we need a part to bring IG-11 back to life, but then in the very next episode, we just go to Tatooine and she gives us R5 for some reason, and and then we just kind of seem to forget about the IG-11 storyline, and it seems, and, and the reason he even wanted it, it seems to be kind of like unneeded in the first place, and so the whole thing, again... If you want to do that storyline and, and you you want to get it to the place where we're going to get it, where IG-12 is going to be part of the season and we're going to go back to IG-11, right? There is a way to make that fit more organically into the story flow. It's just not within these first, especially three episodes where, I, I you know, I think you need to cut the Navarro storyline, at least as is, you need to find a different way to edit that into the season. And and what you should be doing is editing in portions of the Dr. Pershing story so that in those first two episodes, we're actually traveling to Coruscant and seeing that storyline kind of progress until we get to a head. And then it doesn't feel like, oh, we're going to put this in the longest episode of the season. It's going to take up an entire chunk of the middle of it. And we're going to bookend with Bo and Din, where it's just like, it, there's a much better way to edit this stuff together. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I think it, you know, we talked about the Bad Batch season two last week, John. And one of the hallmarks of that series and season specifically was the way in which the story was edited together. So that mm-hmm. every episode is specifically building all these little plot points that are going to play out by the time we get to the very end of the season. And that's exactly what Mando wants to do, but I think kind of fails at doing. Well, I think um, just in this discussion, it, if you're going to do an apples to apples comparison there, it's because Bad Batch knew it was working episodically, which is the same way the Clone Wars worked, which is the same way Lucas's movies worked, which was... Yes, to get the whole story, you have to watch everything. But if you were to jump in halfway, you can still pick up what's going on. And I I think as we sit here teasing it out, Mando season three, its big problem is whenever I've replayed it in my head, I say to myself, I bet if I marathoned this, if I watch this the way that I watch Stranger Things season three or season four or something like that, it works a lot better. The problem is that you have to adapt to the way your show is being shown. You can't think, oh, well, everybody's shotgunning this. They're not. Right. Well, you especially the way watch it's, this. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So you have to respect that it has to work both as a binge watch and as a weekly episodic series. I think that's where mm-hmm. it kind of falls down. Well, and I think that. This is a place where this season, it was trying to be two different things that don't work. It was trying to be episodic and arced 
all at the same time in a way that, again, the first two seasons, I think, really pulled this off very well. The problem is, is that this season and the story that you're telling needs to be told in a way that Star Trek Picard has been told in season three, which did a, a, a full art season really well. And I think Andor did um, where you it, again, you're. You're realizing that each of your episodes are part of a greater whole. And so, therefore, your story editing that way, rather than half-heartedly trying to story edit between episodic and between arc. Because I don't think that those two work very well, at least the way they tried to do it this season. Yeah, I, I mean, they, they, they can work perfectly well together, but it's... It, it, it You need... If you go back to the first two seasons of Mando, for instance... You need the quote unquote constant cliffhanger. Every episode's got to be one where you're right. like, oh, I, I can't wait to see what's next. That was really missing from this season. Yeah, it's a good you, point. You yep. go to the Dr. Pershing episode, it, it the feeling is more like, oh, okay, that happened. And you go a couple episodes in, you're like, oh, okay, that, ha oh, oh, look, there's, oh, okay, there's a Marvel style, you know, post credit scene. Well, I, that's a shame that couldn't be worked into every, you know, it, it felt a little, that's why it felt disjointed, and I'll go ahead and call it out. I think that's why the second to last episode worked really well, is it was very obviously written to lean into the, yes. oh my yes. gosh, what's going to happen next? And exactly. you need to have that constant, mm -hmm. you have to give the audience the, the, the oh my gosh, what's going to happen? Hawkeye yeah, did that. The, the, Marvel, yeah. the Marvel series, Hawkeye did that. Mm -hmm. Yes, you're absolutely right. And and I think, again, you're calling out a series to which, um, you know, Hawkeye does it. I think, again, um, you know, Chris and I just finished talking about Star Trek Picard season three on the Artificial Tango. So it's, you know, right there in the front of my mind. And each one of those episodes in the same way would leave you on kind of like a cliffhanger for the next episode. So, no, I, I think you're 100 percent right in that. And it is it's strange to me, too, that a series that was so good the first two seasons in being able to tell its story well, I think, you know, they say there's the sophomore slump, but I think that this has the junior slump um, because just there was something that was kind of off about this season. And again, it could have been for the fact that Maybe they're trying to insert plot points because they need to, because of where they're going, because we lost an entire show. But that still doesn't mean that you can't story edit in a way that makes that feel seamless. It's absolutely yes. possible. And I think it's absolutely possible even to take all the pieces that this season have and reorder them in a way that makes it flow seamlessly. You know what? You know what solves this problem a lot? And it's something I've made reference to before as you go ahead and you make your season like uh, they the BBC approached those uh, Benedict Cumberbatch Sherlock series mm -hmm. where you yeah. just have three hour and a half long movies. Yeah, Everybody's happy. Point. Yeah, and you're not trying to stretch it out. You're not trying to be like, ooh, look, it's eight episodes. Like just just have three mm -hmm. hour and a half long yeah. movies and, yep, and it's fine. Yep. And we would all love that. It may be, you know, heck, we're working towards a – Dave Filoni film that's going to be, you know, kind of bringing the culmination of a lot of the story points that have been going on in these Filoni verse series. So um, I wanted to ask you, because it just kind of breaking up the series, you know, it's too hard to talk through every episode and stuff, but I just wanted to talk through some of the different character stories that we get. Um, and, you know, Din's story here is interesting in the sense that we, you know, we left him in the last season that he needed to go to Mandalore to, to find redemption in the living waters and I wanted to ask you how you felt about uh, this this character and where we kind of bring him in the series, because I, I know a lot has been made with fans and I've just seen online, you know, um, social media and stuff, is that it feels almost as if Din's story took a step back for the larger story that we're telling here. 
And so how do you feel about this character and, and where we kind of bring him from start to finish in this season? Honestly, it feels like his story is pretty much over. He's not in the spotlight anymore. I, I'm not saying that in a negative way. He's at an ending. And it's a satisfying ending. And uh, in terms of step backward, I did find it odd that we backpedaled so hard to make sure that he keeps the helmet on and he didn't remove it once this season. That wow. felt weird because our yeah. whole thing was about moving him forward into the larger narrative and the larger galaxy and realizing that there is, there is your creed and then there's your faith and those aren't necessarily, you know, sometimes you, you have trouble reconciling those. And then it seems that the allowance for the way we would like to see Din got transferred to Bo. She walks in two worlds. She can have her helmet off if she wants to. It's fine. Yeah. It would have made a lot of sense to have Din be that way and say, you've shown that, you know, the, the universe is calling you to something bigger. Mm -hmm. We need you able right. to do this. So it seemed odd. It did seem like a bit of transference to Bo-Katan. You know, I don't mind it. Um, so much as it just felt like Din lost some of the, some of the focus in his own series, sort of mm -hmm. like what happened with yeah. Boba Fett, where it's like, oh, you know, Book of Boba Fett was like, is this real? is this really Boba Fett's show or is this something else? I, I agree with everything you said there. And, and I think it's because I, I also believe that there's a way for Din and Bo to coexist in the same show, but not have one take a backseat to the other. And and to go off the story point that you're talking about with the helmet, I think that the, the story point there is that for the armorer to tell not only Bo, but Din, that together you are what bring mandalorians together both mm -hmm. sides of the faction and in fact to prove that din you may remove your helmet as well mm -hmm. so that we have this this colliding of factions right and finding cohesion so that in the end as the mandalorians come together and try to create one society that the armorer gives her faction the choice. You may now live as these other Mandalorians do, or you may choose to continue to live in the way that we have. But either way is going to be acceptable here on the new Mandalore. And I mm -hmm. think that allows Din then to be an architect and, a, and, and more involved with the rest of the story um, and feel more important to the story so that all that transference just doesn't end up on Bo-Katan's shoulders. Which, again, if you're a longtime Star Wars fan, I think makes complete sense, right? That that character is in this position. But, you know, maybe if you're just like a Mandalorian person, it really does feel like Din is taking a back seat in his own show. And, it, and, and that seems a little bit weird, especially since... He's the one responsible for, you know, bringing Bo into the fold. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and then I think even showing the perpetuation of Mandalorian culture as he has been brought in by adopting Grogu in the end. And so it... it I really, I feel like just kind of comes down to one, some story choices for the character, but also again, story editing. And you really could have, I feel like kind of fix these criticisms with a couple of things that would, I think have enhanced not only his character, but it's just the story overall, really. Yeah. I, I, I agree. It's, um, it's puzzling because the, the moments that did work this season worked really well, but this is, this is, I think gets to the core of it too, is that 
I didn't, I didn't get the idea that Din was still moving in the same direction. So, and, and the thing is, mm-hmm. why does he have to put his helmet? Well, okay, they have to go back to Mandalore so he can put his helmet back on, so he can go in the water, so that she can see the mythosaur, which is cool. Right. But may, maybe it's a little, I you know, there, there are just, I think we, we just wind up hitting the same, you know, <laughs> we wind up hitting the same note and I'm, I don't want to do that, but sure. it, it is, you know, it, it, it does get to that. And it, I think mm-hmm. it's a shame because there are so many moments that are, are beautiful. You know, the, the, just him sitting on the front porch, watching his kid play. Yeah. That's yeah. adorable. Yeah. It's wonderful. And it's just, it all came well, together so odd. And I think what's kind of great about this is, in that sense is that, you know, with this storyline with the Mandalorians, we've kind of somewhat put that to bed in the sense they have their planet back. You know, Bo-Katan is their leader and everything. But Din has actually made himself a part of the larger mythology of Star Wars by going to Carson Teva and getting this under the table deal for himself to help keep law and order in the outer rim because, you know, these new Republic Rangers can't. Uh, They don't have the manpower to be able to do that the way they would want to. And so we are pushing the, you know, him into the larger mythology of Star Wars in in a pretty big way because now he is, you know, under the table working for the new Republic, which puts him into larger story points, especially as we know what's coming with Ahsoka and the fact that Thrawn and all this stuff, like this this allows that character to be in that position now to to make sense that he's going to be part of the larger mythology, not just the Mando mythology that we've been creating over the last two seasons. I mean, you want to make everything a little more come together a little bit differently. Find a way to have it be that uh, Carson Teva winds up moving their outpost to Navarro. Mm, and so Mando great, gets his yep. house there. Mm-hmm. You know, the Mandalorians yep. are going to go back to Mandalore. Do you still have that land for me? Because you could give it to these guys and we'll have an unofficial, we'll have our own little secret base here where it's not, you right. even say it's not officially, you know, and it, my gosh, I, like I, I, I know people hate it when, when we do this sort of thing, but imagine a scene where they set up this unofficial ish base and Carson Teva says, you know, we're kind of living like an, you know, I'm kind of, now I'm kind of living like an outlaw and Din can look at him and say, welcome to my world, you know, and just sort of like mm-hmm. may, may I, you, you even, you even wind up setting up that idea that uh, of, of the faction that Leia is going to have to take over when the, when everything falls I, apart later. I like that. I like that. I also was thinking too, you know, on Navarro, you're saying you are an independent system, which is great, but you could have a new Republic embassy basically there, mm-hmm. uh, which, you know, that also allows you to be able to do that and also puts an outpost out there that's far away from what's happening at the middle of the the galaxy when, you know, the First Order and all that. So, yeah, I mean, there's two great ways that you can go here to be able to bring this together so no and and look i I think one of the things you know we always try to do here i know you and i especially when we're talking about these things you know we don't want to just be critical we want to be constructively critical and and i think what we're saying here is that the seeds of what you need to make this even more successful are already here Mm -hmm. it's just like minor tweaks you know that i think make it more successful which Leads me to a question that I've really been struggling with this this season specifically and this character. You know, Grogu came on the scene and he just took the world by storm. And how do you feel about this character now, especially in light of I, th- I think this season, the fact that he's our, he's back with Mando? We know because of the Book of Boba Fett. We, I don't necessarily know if we have a really clear understanding of just how much time he spent with Luke. So, you know, just for your average viewer, this seems like a very quick turnaround. 
And the character, that I think it himself, just has not progressed very much in the seasons that we have had him. So I, I don't know. How are you feeling? He's definitely still a child. And I think that he's very childlike. But he's more childlike in that he's childish. And I, I'll be the oddball. I like it. Him getting the IG-12 suit was one of my favorite moments of Star Wars. It was the most whimsically funny and cute thing. And I think was very relatable to anybody who's had a kid where, you know, no, he's too young. I can't do it. No, no, no. Yes, yes, yes. No, no, yes. Like that was, I thought that was the whim. That's the type of whimsy that I enjoy in Star Wars. That's the whimsy that gave me uh, C-3PO and R2-D2, that gave me Jar Jar, that gave me Boss Nass, that gave me uh, Pit Droids. That gave, like, those are the things that I like. And I think that IG, the IG-12 suit is great because, in all honesty, it finally gave Grogu the opportunity to be like a normal kid. Because when you think about it, the reason I like where Grogu is, where he's gone in this season, even though he gets overshadowed, I don't like the fact that he got overshadowed this season, but where I, why I like where he went is the first two seasons, it's all been about, oh, he's so important. Oh my gosh, it's Grogu. Oh my gosh, Grogu. Oh my gosh, protect Grogu. And now that he's back with Mando, Grogu is just getting a chance to be a kid. And in a sense... Intended or not, it plays into the whole idea of where the Jedi went wrong again, which was they didn't treat, they didn't let kids be kids. They treated them like little adults with grave power and responsibility and everything. And it's like, sometimes you just need to grow up with a loving parent or a loving aunt and uncle on a farm somewhere to turn out a little bit more well-adjusted than, you know, somebody who grows up in a temple without emotional attachment. So I think uh, I definitely agree with everything you said, honestly, in, 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 in the sense of allowing him to be a kid and all of these type of things. Um, I, and so I, I really liked that. Um, and I will say to me, I, I'm, I am personally growing tired of the shtick of him being a baby basically. I'm I'm ready for him to move past the baby stage. Being a young kid is still fine. I'm just kind of tired of this character not being able to talk and acting like an actual baby when it it just it's enough. I I think um we we've seen it. It's cute, it's fun and I again, I I liked I, I thought, you know, giving him the suit and everything again because because he's so small still at this point. I think all that was great. Um, but I'm I'm ready for the character to progress past a baby. Um, mm-hmm. I'm tired of baby Yoda. I want, you know, seven-year-old Yoda, basically. You know, I'm ready for elementary school Yoda and <laughs> at this mm-hmm. point. And so um, I think that's the problem that I'm having. And And I think part of it is because... I am not quite sure. I think this season has actually made his storyline muddy in a way that I don't know what we're trying to do anymore with the character, um, you know, because the whole thing was about getting him to Luke, but now he's back with Mando, and it seems more because we're afraid to actually almost do that story-wise um, and take away our, you know, big star um, and they haven't really necessarily legitimized for me him being back with Din in a way that just really feels powerful, right? Um, I, I, I don't know. I don't know if any of that makes any sense, but it, it just feels well, it a little sense. bit I, haphazard. I, th- I think that... Um... For all of the the bits that we you know we both acknowledge, where it's like okay, he's acting more like a normal kid. He's he's no longer 
you know, given all of this pressure and everything, there's still, let's go to the Lizzo and Jack Black episode. He gets infantilized in that moment. His, mm -hmm. yeah. his growth forward happens when he's in the IG-12 suit and he can start getting some individual agency. And then right, yeah. he's there in the, in the last two episodes and he's being a, a little, you know, uh, uh, he contributes to the story. But then there are the other moments where he's either absent ish or being just there as decoration in yeah. that one episode. Yep. That that's the thing that really got under my skin about that episode was there point. were moments there were moments in this series where Grogu became decoration. And it's like, no, he's supposed to be a main character. Yeah. No, and I, I mean, but then we have him at the end of the season be able to save Mando again and Bo-Katan this way by performing the same feat that he did in the first season, yeah. but in a heightened way in the sense that, okay, the first season we saw what he can do and it really wore him out and like, but it's like this allows us to actually see, okay, this character has progressed. Like it, he had learned something like he, he, there has been movement in, in his growth and yet, I think what I'm just saying is in the end, I would have just wanted and I wanted more of that for the character because I think we missed a real opportunity to be able to have the character speak at the very end um, of the season. He can still be adopted by Din, but to be able to finally cross that threshold, I was expecting it and I'm honestly... Uh, very frustrated that we did not pass that threshold um, that, that we, you know, kind of kept a lid on his ability to be able to talk when I don't necessarily think that that needed to be the case. And I think would have added in that episode to the fact that, mm. okay, we've seen his force powers and his abilities grow there, but now we're moving to the character to the point where like, yeah, he can actually verbalize things now. I mean, it doesn't have to be whole sentences, but it could be, you know, like like a child, uh, like you get a few things here and there. Uh, meh. <laughs> I don't know. It's tough because once the kid speaks, you can't unring that bell. And if you miss the boat on the voice or the first word, you're going to anger more people than you please. And well, I mean, you have to do it sometime, though. So, I mean, it's it's not like he can stay this way forever unless they decide not to bring him back and just have mando go off and be like oh no i left him at home because it's safer there or something which he wouldn't do of course but right yeah uh yeah i don't know um it, it's it, it's it is really interesting and 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 again this is a fascinating thing to me because it's it's not something that uh, you know I've just felt I've 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 had other friends who have verbalized the same thing and have been kind of frustrated with the the story arc as well and so um quickly though we did finally learn who saved Grogu in Order 66 and it's none other than Ahmed Best as Kellerin Beck uh which I mean how cool was that Oh I was thrilled to see Ahmed Best I I you know, that was one of those ones where I wanted to give the guy a hug and just say, all right, mm -hmm. you, you got mm -hmm. it, buddy. That's right. We do love you. And we, we love that you're you're being brought back in. And, and it's um, it's an even warmer feeling than having uh, Hayden Christensen warmly brought back for right. the Kenobi series. It's people minimize or forget or weren't there for exactly how savagely Ahmed best was treated. And I know this mm -hmm. has nothing to do with his character on screen, but seeing him there and seeing him get what is, I think inarguably the coolest cameo of the entire series. It's actually cooler yeah. than Luke oh, because yeah. Yeah, of everything cool. that, that carries yeah. along with it. And I really enjoyed seeing it. I want to see more of him because I have my suspicion about who his friend was from Naboo. Mm -hmm. But uh, my yeah. my suspicion is that uh, he delivered him to one Chancellor Palpatine, who was a great friend to the Jedi, 
uh, up until a certain moment. I do. I think I th- I think he winds up blundering into giving Grogu to uh, Sidious. Ooh, see, I mean, that is an interesting theory that I had not thought of because my theory is is that he gave him to Jar Jar. Also, very that would be if they had Ahmed Best as a right Jedi right? human giving Grogu to Ahmed Best, reprising his role as Jar Jar. That basically implies that Jar Jar is going to accidentally give him to Palpatine anyway. Um, I mean, it could but, it could be the case, but I just like I, I yeah. love the idea because I was trying to think of like obviously this is, cannot be Padme, but yeah. who else would have a Naboo uh, starship? And well, I mean, the senator from Naboo would, and who would be willing to help Jedi at that point? Jar Jar Binks would be, and mm-hmm. so and just again the connection between. Uh, the two characters because of Ahmed Best, it just seemed kind of per- perfect. And I was also thinking, what a cool way to have Jar Jar have survived. But not only that, but have you know maybe been able to uh, save you know this Jedi youngling. So would have been mm-hmm. pretty cool. But we we talked a lot about the idea of you know Din kind of moving some of his story to Bo Katan. And Bo-Katan obviously becomes a huge part of this series, which, you know, I, as a fan, had no problem with. Um, but what did you think of the way her arc worked throughout the series, of her becoming part of the Covert, winning her fleet back, um, you know, uh, kind of her selfless acts that end up winning her the Darksaber? What did you think of all that? I liked it. I thought it worked really well. I thought that um, the only downside was that, um, again, for things like the Dr. Pershing episode, you could have spent more time having Bo talk about, yes. you know, his her, her previous compatriots leaving her. You could have had her try to reach them and have them turn her down one time. You could have had m- basically more Bo-Katan, and I would have enjoyed more Bo-Katan. And I would have preferred <laughs> you know i so it's, it's as straightforward as that i think that her arc was great i loved the fact that she's the one that saw the mythosaur and it gave her one of those moments where she had to really truly ask herself what she believed what was possible yes but even her her reticence to share it with anybody mm-hmm. because she like there's a certain fear about finding faith where you're like oh i'm not known yeah. for this yeah how how do I how do I go about sharing this? And so I, I really liked what she did with with uh, what they did with her her storyline. I could not agree with you more. I, I think one to me, it's clear that her arc is the most consistent and well done in the season from start to finish. Uh, and and I think you brought up just a really great point watching this character go from somebody who is faithless to being faithful is really interesting especially since her desire to lead had been somewhat selfish and now she has become selfless which is such a big star wars story point so i loved that and again it was her selflessness of going to help save din which allows her to win the Darksaber, of course, via, you know, uh, Elder Wand rules. Um, yeah. And uh, which, so funny that that, I mean, I, we called the first, uh, the second season episode um, uh, something about the Elder Saber. And I mean, this this is clearly what um, we're, we're doing here. But I love that. You know, Dave loves the pull from other genres and stories. And I think it, it's great. And... And works really well. And then watching her see, watching her be able to not only retake Mandalore, but with the help of Din and Grogu, be able to finally defeat this thorn in the side of all Mandalorians was, I think, phenomenal. But the biggest thing for me with her, John, became this theme that she discussed, which, you know, we talk many times about the way in which Star Wars can give us themes that are so important for now, but also all time. Uh, and when she said, our people have suffered time and again, 
from division and squabbling factions. Mandalore has always been too powerful for any enemy to defeat. It is always our own division that destroys us. And I was like, well said, Bo-Katan. Well said, because that felt very poignant for the world in which we live. Yeah. I, I mean, it's, uh, it, I always think of the, um, the epigraph at the beginning of Mel Gibson's film Apocalypto. Um, and I'm going to butcher it, but it, it basically says that in order for a society to be destroyed from without, it has to destroy itself from within first. Mm-hmm. And 100%. that's the same sort of theme. And it is, uh, yeah. Um, what I find interesting, what I find really cool about her path to faith is they didn't turn her into a um, a firebrand about it. They they respected that a character like this would have to come at it from still from an intellectual standpoint and reconcile it, as opposed to uh, you know coming at it with the the fervor of the ex smoker who suddenly wants everybody to stop smoking and you know, those sorts of things. So I, I thought, I thought it, it worked really well. It, again, I just wish there was more of it. I wish there was more focus on it. I wish mm-hmm. that, uh, yeah. there had been more. I honestly wish there had been more dialogue from Din about what it meant to him to hold his faith so dear. And have like an actual conversation between the two of them where we even get to that point where she says, I, I just, I don't know. Am I going to keep my helmet on? And for Din to say, from what I've seen, it doesn't matter whether you do. And so you have somebody who said, who basically says, I chose this way, but I still see the, the dignity and faith in you, even though you're not doing it the way I do it. That would have been a tremendous good, moment, yeah. not just for her, yeah. but for Din. Well, and and it's it, I love what you're saying there because there's a portion of that conversation, you know, when they're on the skiff mm-hmm. on Mandalore, and he's saying how you know the dark saber means nothing to him or his people, and and yet he's going to follow her um, until her song is written. You know, and it's it's a beautiful moment, but I think, again, tweaking with what you said, that if you had made that conversation two minutes longer, maybe a minute longer, you could have added something to which really galvanizes the character of Bo-Katan in a way that makes it even more special um, for who she's becoming, which is the leader of the Mandalorians. But mm-hmm. not just her faction of Mandalorians, but all Mandalorians, because she is the one who has realized, and part of this is the greatness of her living so long and her experience in the past, which is allows her to know we have got to stop doing what we've been doing for so long because it's destroying us. And unless mm-hmm. we choose another way, we will be destroyed. Mm-hmm. And... It's another great reference to the idea of how important it is to remember the past and learn from it so that we can forge a different future. And so I think that's fantastic. Um, The New Republic that we see here, John, is interesting. And I would say it's slightly uh, sad to see that the New Republic is already a bureaucratic nightmare. uh, so soon uh, after Return of the Jedi, um, you know, I mean, this is six, seven, maybe eight years after Return of the Jedi. We don't really know. Uh, and but it was obviously there. They have to start tying into where we're going to go 30 years later. But to see that it's like, you know, it's already bad is like, oh, that sucks. But again, you have a missed opportunity, I think, because I think the better way to convey it would have been to have a ton of people around who were who were working for the previous administration and have yeah, somebody sit there like Carson Teva say 
uh, what do you know? You know, you you worked for the Empire. Now you work for the Republic. Do you even have an allegiance? And somebody to say, it's just a job, man. I don't care who's at the top. But what do I, I got to feed my, you know, which is a very real world relatable sort of thing to hear yeah. somebody say. You know, what do you want me to do about it? You want me to go up and, and fight the bureaucracy? I couldn't fight the bureaucracy back when I was, uh, back when I was Tarkin was in charge of this division. What, what am I going to do? He goes, it's the same people at the top, no matter what. And that conveys it a lot better and a lot less clunkily than that uh, Coruscant Opera House discussion in the beginning. And that would show why the New Republic was having so much trouble governing is because Mm -hmm. in all honesty, once a government bureaucracy is large enough, it doesn't matter who's in charge at the top anymore. Yeah, that's because people are just going to follow, you know, oh, no, my job is to do this. What am I thinking about? What, What do I care what I'm doing? And and it would you know it would even speak to you know why bother even having um uh the the whole thing with like oh these are you know, I I mean I like the idea of you know we're trying to repatriate these people who used to be in the empire and everything but have pockets of people in there saying you know uh, no I'm 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 slowing this order down because I I don't like the new republic I like right I like my old guys so but uh, you know I'm not going to fight them. But they don't know how to run this thing. I'll slow the yeah. machine down. And it becomes like a quiet revolution sort of thing. Couldn't agree with you more. I mean, I, I just, it was, I think it's one of those places where you you are also just kind of stuck with the story that comes later. And so, therefore, you don't have the ability to do anything different. And so, and I think you have again rightly put your finger on a way in which we could make this story feel better uh and make more sense and just connect better not only with the world we live in but but also i think with the history that we know as well which is lucas was always so good at i also wish that they would have taken the opportunity to do what I would have liked to have even seen in the, in the sequel trilogy originally, which is have the new Republic using star destroyers and tie fighters and have people arguing, my gosh, why are you using these right. things? They, they were the Imperials and have somebody at the top saying, how am I going to build a new Navy overnight? We need the ships. Right. And that would have been even more symbolic about how, the new Republic won, but they had no idea what they were getting into when they got into it. And so they're left using the stuff. And so to the P you know, to some people in the mid and outer rim, it didn't matter that the new Republic won because they're look, they're still in star destroyers. We all know what that means. Yeah. Well, and instead, I mean, again, this is also because of the story we already have is that, you know, they're, they're disarming themselves before they're even mm-hmm. really ready to disarm themselves. And, and, and that's a story point that needed to be hit harder because mm-hmm. it, it, that's where we're going with the New Republic. And that becomes one of the major frustrations then as we move forward, especially for what Leia, you know, will fight against in the Senate and, and um, you know, Claudia Gray's book uh, and forward. So... Uh, we we mentioned a little bit about some cameos and stunt casting, John. And so I do think, you know, Tim Meadows is in this season. Jack mm-hmm. Black, Lizzo, uh, Christopher Lloyd. We had Zeb show up. IG-11's back. We saw a mythosaur. We saw a droid bar, which was pretty cool. Like, out of these, which do you think were the most successful? And, and then were there some where you feel like, we're not so successful. Droid Bar, Mythosaur, Zeb. Those were my three favorites, hands down. I loved seeing Christopher Lloyd. I thought that in in a more tightly disciplined episode, his role is super duper interesting and important. I thought he gave it his all mm-hmm. and he played the part very well. And I thought it was very interesting showing that there was even uh, a remnant that still held on to the idea of the separatists is really interesting and cool. 
Uh, Jack Black, I thought, did fine. Lizzo is not an actress. I, I, you know, and that's fine. You can have non-actress appearances, but when it's somebody who's so readily recognizable, who isn't an actor or actress, it, it clumsies it up. IG-11 coming back? Uh, I, you know how I feel about bringing characters back from the dead. Somehow, IG-11 has returned. But at least this one has, you know, an explanation that, that you know, in the moment yeah. that makes sense. I mean, he's a droid, so at least the parts do exist out there and make sense. But, but I mean, um, he's not really yeah. IG-11. No, he's not. No. He's not. And that's that's the thing is he's not really IG-11, and that's why I can be okay with it. Yeah. Because even if he has the same voice and the same mannerisms, he's not IG-11. You know, it's mm-hmm. the whole ship of Theseus thing. And it, but once his memory core is smashed, which I believe they say happened, right? Yes. Yeah, because they it, were looking. Uh, well, they were looking for a new, like I guess, memory circuit or something. I believe. Yeah. And so, yeah, it did. It, there is there is something to this that it it's not going to be the exact same IG eleven that you got. Like it's going to be IG eleven point two. IG eleven B. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Um, I, I I think, uh, you know, obviously Zeb was great. I loved seeing him. And, and of course, we're really setting up, I think, at that point, um, you know, what we are going to be doing uh, with uh, the Ahsoka series coming back and utilizing a lot of the Rebels characters. So that was fun. Um, I'm a little bit harsher on Jack Black than you were. And I think part of it is just because when you're doing stunt casting like this, you have to be careful to not cast somebody who's so recognizable that they actually take away from what's happening on screen. And I think mm-hmm. that that's where both Jack Black and Lizzo just, they detract from their episode because their star power is too big to slide into this genre like this. It's kind of the same reason that a lot of people not necessarily myself, but other people had the same thoughts about uh, Samuel L. Jackson. You know, um, can your That's, star power be too no. big? So, um, yeah, I, I'm with you. I think the Mythosaur and the Droid Bar were fantastic. I thought Christopher Lloyd's part, and this is where by having Jack Black and Lizzo be in there, you're actually missing story point opportunities to expound more on his character because he's the real key here. And what he's actually talking about is so interesting, it's really worth diving into. So, But on a whole, you know, um, it is what it is. And at the same point, you know, Gideon's end, I'm really interested to see what you think about this because we finally learned what he was doing with Dr. Pershing and Grogu him wanting to make himself force sensitive. He's creating these clones. We've got the shadow council with captain Pelion, which is great. And Brenda Hux, you know, like all this really cool stuff. He creates the best next gen troopers I've ever seen. Uh, Full stop there for one second. (laughs) Cause I have to make this dig every single time, but yet another instance where somebody designed better next generation stormtrooper armor than JJ Abrams did. Yes. Yes. And better ships, better yeah. armor. Gah. Yeah. And I got to deal yep. with smiley troopers in the in the yeah. in the sequel trilogy. Yeah. I got to deal with the the iPhone store army. Yeah. Yep. I just I, this was another place where I think Gideon is obviously a really interesting villain, and yet. Because we leave his revelation till basically the end of the season, I think we actually hurt the storyline for him by not weaving him into the story sooner so that, I don't know, it just, it felt like, yeah, he's this great villain and then we're able to defeat him in a couple of episodes and and then he's actually, I think, he's kind of demoted and diminished as a villain because of that. I think that you're right. 
I would have played up his escape war earlier in the season and had, um, you know, rumors of his death more exaggerated, have him become like a boogeyman that people talk about, have him, if you're going to show that pilot's bar for the New Republic, have got, have people arguing at the beginning of the scene as to whether he's actually dead or not. And so when the shuttle is discovered later and they say, wait, this was the shuttle that he was like basically build to it more. So I agree with you there. I, I think that they did wind up. We all knew he was coming back. So in a sense, the dramatic nature of it was undercut. Bum, because bum, when bum. He, right. When he showed up, it, it's not, <laughs> it's not that feeling. It's the feeling of, yeah, I knew. Okay. So it feels like it, it should have just been teased out better and, you know, with, with less, with a shorter build, basically. Have him show up. You know, again, it gets that whole thing of like, what are you indulging? What are you inserting? Why, why aren't we getting where we want to be quicker so that we can spend more time doing what we love to do? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, seeing, uh, you know, Captain Pelion was wonderful. I, I, yay. How wonderful is that? Um, having him on Mandalore, I'm fine with. Having him using Grogu to become Force sensitive, again, I would have wanted more time with that. I would have wanted more time with that. And I would have wanted him to seem more determined to recapture Grogu and say, thanks for bringing him to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because he seemed not to really register or care that Grogu was there. So Grogu was done, but we were never left with the impression that he didn't want Grogu anymore. Right. Well, and then he is the one through his spy that had Pershing killed so does he not care about trying to become force sensitive anymore with these clones? And that seems very strange. Um, and, and and I would say doesn't really make a ton of story sense. Um, and I like you mentioned, he's been basically, it sounds like, stealing information from the Shadow Council and Project Necromancer. And keeping it for himself. But that's that's also not a bigger deal. So it's just like, there's a lot of places here where it's like, and, and I think you've said it really well a few times here, that we've been so focused, I think, on the spectacle of things that we're not necessarily paying attention as much to the story points that we should be. Which... I have to ask you a question about how you felt like the action and effects for this season worked. Um, Because personally, I feel like some of this stuff looked great and some of it looked like the latest Marvel trash that we've been getting. And it was really disappointing. I won't use words that harsh, but I will say that it was uh, terribly inconsistent. So that that's my way of agreeing with you that there were moments where I, I said, wow, that's amazing. That's wonderful. That's groundbreaking. This is fantastic effects work. And there was other stuff where I said, oh, okay, they had a deadline. Which again, I'm not saying is a pejorative to dig on a crew or anything like that, but more along the sense of I felt bad because everybody wants their best work out there. And there was just a lot of stuff that felt like it was, okay, good enough, just call it we're gonna come we're gonna be done whereas if you look at the first two seasons of the mandalorian you know it looked like either they put more resources into it or they took more time to do it either one's a valid read i guess but that was that was the difficulty for me was its inconsistency uh, especially, you know what, uh, seems to be my favorite one to kick on the, you know, the, the cat, the, uh, Dr. Pershing episode. There were a lot of backgrounds there where I was like, what is, what is happening yeah. here? Yeah. Where it felt like some of the stuff that was less successful in even attack of the clones where I'm like, woo, woo. Okay. This is too flat. And 
Mm-hmm. I expected more depth yeah. from it. But then even let's go to the Lizzo and Jack Black episode. There was this one shot where the flower thing was behind her or something. Mm-hmm. And it was almost hypnotic to me how it didn't work at all. Yeah. It, yep. it, it was mesmerizing, but for all the wrong reasons, because I was staring <laughs> at it saying, this doesn't work at all. Yep, like, I what agree. were you thinking when you tried to do this? You knew, like, there's no way you didn't know this wasn't working. You know, so, um, and then, but then you have, uh, and I know there's a lot of practical involved, but like the, just all of the droids and everything in the droid bar in the same episode. It's like, this is magnificent. I love the way this looks and plays. And then, you know, you have the flowers behind Lizzo or the, the, the game that they're playing. And it's like, ooh, ooh, that, that doesn't work too well. No. There were, there were even shots in the finale where I was stunned with how they, they lacked the necessary mm. depth. Yeah, and I think that's one of the places where uh, the, the volume really just has a weakness because there are only so many angles you can shoot at that it really looks right. Mm-hmm. And it's very constricting then on the actors and what they can do and the movement that they have. And, you know, I, I think... This is why Andor is the best looking Star Wars live action television show they've done because everything they're trying to do for real and they did a lot of it for real. And when they are using digital technology, it's to fill in what they or augment what was real. And that's so much better than, you know, um, I mean, what's crazy is that a lot of the green screen and blue screen work that you had in the prequels looks better than some of this stuff and it's just pretty shocking um yes that that's the case yes it is those moments are shocking i'm all for push that envelope push oh, the envelope too. until yeah. it catches on fire until it rips until people are driven to the point of insanity go crazy with it but at the same time understand that the landscape has changed especially in the post avatar and especially avatar way of water world where you say to yourself like audiences are just becoming more discerning they they can see the magic oh, trick yeah. now and it's it's not like it was back in the old days where you could fool a lot of the people most of the time now most of the people are in on the gag and they they know what to look for and so it's even more challenging to get it to the point where it needs to be. Yeah, 100%. Um, one last thing I just wanted to ask you real quick. Uh, you know, we had Ludwig Gorenson, who had done the music for the first two seasons here, and now we have Joseph Shirley stepping in, who did the Book of uh, Boba Fett music. And how did you feel about that? Because it's similar, but it is, it's not quite the same either. I thought it was fine. There was nothing there was nothing that jumped out at me as misplaced. I, I thought the score worked fine. Uh, was there anything that like lit me on fire? No. But I thought it worked fine for and it accomplished plenty. I think what is interesting to me about the score is the way in which Shirley is able to use a lot of the sounds that Gorenson created, but he has also added in a more classic symphonic Star Wars type score to the series. So it still has some of the Mandalorian sounds, but it also feels like and maybe this is on purpose in the sense that the series is is now connecting more towards a Williams musical sound of universe, right? Because that's we're we're moving towards like all of these things culminating in a film. Mm-hmm. So that would make sense to me. And then of course, you know, we know in Ahsoka that Kevin Kiner is going to be doing the music for that. And so 
I get, and I, I think it's good. I think it's really good. I think uh, Shirley's done a great job of kind of combining both worlds. And, um, I, I, I've enjoyed the score, uh, for, for the season. So I thought he did a great job. Um, well, John, we've had a lot of, I think, very interesting things to say about this season, some pointed criticisms, some things that we actually really liked. Where would you fall in a rating for this season, do you think? Oh, boy. That's a tough one, man. That's a tough one. <sighs> Readily acknowledging that there are parts that I thought were wonderful. Again, they're wonderful for some of the wrong reasons because they strike the nostalgic chord. Captain Pelion getting a lot of Bo-Katan. Like, I have reasons to care about that. The fact that um, the design team was given more leeway to come up with beautiful armor designs, which I have an absolute fetish for. Um, I I gotta go with a three and a half out of five for this one. I'm I might even be more generous than I want to be because there are the things that I loved, I loved. But there were so many things that were just puzzling to me that they pursued. Especially I uh, I guess we'll, I'll split the difference Captain Eastergrass. Um I I thought the ship design was cool, but I I don't know what the point of that was, really. There was kind of a point, but it could have been made differently and using less screen time. And the Lizzo and Jack Black stuff was like that, that detracted from something I really cared about. Dr. Pershing completely derailed the storytelling for the whole season. Which makes me feel bad because the guy who plays Dr. Pershing, he did it so well. And yeah, I agree. I feel bad for the guy because he, he gets a whole episode dedicated just to him and everybody just spends their time kicking it. And I, I feel kind of guilty about that. It feels weird. So, but yeah, three and a half out of five. I'm really torn. Cause I don't know if I should give this a three or a three and a half. Yeah. And I think I will go with the three and a half because this is the season where Bo Katan got to be a real badass. And mm -hmm. I'm just going to be generous. But I would say that if I was not being generous, this is a three. Yeah. And in all, in all honesty, I'm, I'm really shocked to be at this place because, you know, I, The Mandalorian, I think overall for the first two seasons was a fantastic show. And this season, I just felt like it lost its way a little bit. And mm -hmm. I'm hoping that as we look towards the opportunity to have, you know, fourth season and as they look towards finding a way to, to combine all of these things with a film that Filoni is going to direct, that we find a way to be able to figure out what the heart of this series is and connect it with the larger mythology without losing the heart. Because I think I think that's the thing that to me was missing was the heart, um, and because I just didn't feel like they did a good enough job with the heart of the show, which was the Grogu Din storyline, because it took such of a backseat in the way that it did, especially with the story editing. We just don't really have the heart of the series the way we wanted it, and so. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm still looking forward to. I still think this is a good season. It's just not great, and hopefully, as we look towards Ahsoka starting in August, that'll be fantastic, and we can really kick off, you know, continuing uh, this Mandoverse very strongly. But John, uh, if people wanted to catch up with you and you know see what else you've got going on these days, where would they be able to look for you? Oh gosh, just look up Kessel Junkie out there online. I have the most fun over on Letterboxd where I can't get in trouble for talking about movies. Although, I don't know, sometimes I seem to. Anyway, that's where you can find me online is as Kessel Junkie. And you can find me over on the Nerd Party Network, co-hosting two shows. One called House Lights, where we look at the work of directors through different 
sorts of ways and blah, 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 you know, by decade, by character, what have you. And then, of course, I co-host a delightful Star Wars podcast called Aggressive Negotiations with you, Matthew Rushing. Which everybody should check out. Uh, but you could also find me all over social media under the name Matt Rushing02. Uh, Twitter, Instagram, Letterboxd, and Vero are the places I am most active. Of course, outside the 602 Club, I've got Warp 5, Literary Treks, The Orb, Saddle Up, and The Artificial Tango. Uh, you can also find me on the Nerd Party Network outside of Aggressive Negotiations with Owlpost, where Drea Kaufman and I talk about every single chapter of the Star Wars suit of the Harry Potter series, one chapter at a time. But thank you so much for joining us, and may the Force be with you. Thank you.